Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. In this very special episode of the Garden DC podcast, I share a bit about myself, your host, Kathy Jentz. Then we look back at the last 100 episodes, talk about how the podcast got started, and share some of the behind the scenes production secrets. The plant profile is on species tulips, and in our What's New segment, I share what's going on in the garden, as well as some local upcoming gardening events. A few Garden DC listeners have asked me to introduce myself to you. So I thought I'd take the occasion of this 100th episode to share a bit about my background and to let you all behind the scenes of this podcast. Well, I'm Kathy Jentz. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. My main job is as editor and publisher of Washington Gardener Magazine, which is the gardening publication published specifically for Washington DC and its inner and outer suburbs. I'm also the host of this podcast. Among my any other my many other hats is as the editor of Water Garden Journal for the International Water Lily and Water Gardening Society, also known as IWGS. I also edit the Azalean for the Azalea Society of America, and I edit Fanfare for Region 3 of the American Daylily Society. I'm also the co-author of a brand new book with Terry Spate entitled The Urban Garden, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City. A little about myself, I'm a lifelong gardener. I believe that growing plants should be stress-free and enjoyable. My philosophy is inspiration over perspiration. I do a great deal of speaking on gardening, and I've been honored to have presented programs at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, the Philadelphia Flower Show, U.S. Botanic Garden, the Historic Society of Washington, D.C., and many other prestigious venues. But I also give lots of talks to local garden clubs and many other groups. I enjoy spending time on social media, and you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest as WDC Gardener. I also write a monthly column for the Mid-Atlantic Grower, which is from American Farm Publications, where I do a great deal of hand-holding and coaxing to get independent garden centers, plant breeders, and other horticultural businesses to join the social media revolution. Currently, I'm the president of the Silver Spring Garden Club, and I'm on the board of several other garden clubs and organizations. One of the most important leadership duties I hold is on the board of directors of GardenCom, the Association for Garden Communicators. At home, my home garden is one of those mishmash affairs. It's like the cobbler's children's with no shoes, right? I have hardly any time to devote to making it look good. Rather, I plop in a sample plant that I'm sent where I can and let them decide whether they want to live or not. I also have a vegetable garden in a nearby community garden plot, which demands and gets a bit more of my attention. On the somewhat related to gardening side of things, I love cats, and my current fur baby is Santino, a tuxedo Maine Coon. I also have a blog called Cats in Gardens, and that's where I post photos and blurbs every Saturday, aka Catterday, about garden cats. So I welcome any fellow garden cat and garden lovers to share your garden cat photos with me for that blog. And that's what I do for fun on the side. A bit about me personally, I was born in Nuremberg, Germany. My dad was stationed in the army nearby, and my mom is German. We came to the United States when I was a preschooler, where I quickly learned English, and my only sibling, a younger brother, was born at Fort Belvoir in Fairfax County, Virginia, and we mainly stayed in the D.C. area ever since. So I went to the University of Maryland in College Park and majored in journalism with an emphasis on magazine feature writing. My first internships and jobs were at trade and professional associations doing their membership publications and also a bit of event planning and promotions. I do love to travel. 
<sighs> but more than that, I love being home. <laughs> I am a homebody and I'm a big moviegoer. I typically go to several film screenings every month. I also lead a very green lifestyle. Everybody is always surprised to learn that I'm car free. I chose my current home in downtown Silver Spring, Maryland on the DC and Tacoma Park border because I can walk to two nearby metro stations. I can walk to several grocery stores and two movie theaters, including the historic AFI Silver. Now I'm going to turn this episode over to Dorval Bedford, who is interning with Washington Gardner Magazine this semester. Among his tasks is helping to edit this podcast. Dorval, please tell the listeners a bit about yourself, and then feel free to ask me any questions you think the listeners would like to know about me and about this podcast. Sure. My name is Dorval, and like Kathy said, I'm an intern here at the Washington Gardener. Um, I'm also a journalism major at the University of Maryland, and some of my duties include writing articles um, and blogs for the magazine, as well as editing these very episodes. And so, Kathy, um, to move the focus to you, uh, I'd like to first ask a question that you ask all of your guests whenever they come on to the podcast, and that is, can you tell me a little bit about little Kathy? Were you born with chlorophyll in your veins and a green thumb? <laughs> so the tables have turned, right? Um, so I will say that I am actually Katarina. Um, but everybody in my family calls me Kati, and but everybody else in the world calls me Kathy. So we'll start off with that. And just to say that my dad's side of the family were farmers in Indiana, and my mom's side of the family in Germany had a lifelong allotment garden. So I grew up in both a farm and garden situation, visiting both grandparents, and my parents had a garden plot uh, most of our lives that we would visit. I don't remember loving it, frankly, Dorval. <laughs> I was more of the type of kid who had their nose in books um, almost constantly. And so if they would drag me outside or out to the garden, I was more interested in reading, you know, throughout my childhood and in my dream world than I was in the garden itself. But definitely things rubbed off on me and I definitely had an appreciation for the natural world in general and love of animals and love of plants. Speaking of a love for plants, I know that you have both a personal garden as well as a community garden, um, which I actually visited today. And so I was wondering, are there any plants uh, that are your favorite to grow? Sure. So I think my favorite plant of all time and my favorite flower, if anybody were to ask that, would be peony. And so peony is a super easy shrub to grow. It generally dies back to the ground at the end of the year and kind of disappears and then comes back all its on its own. It, there's very little care, super little maintenance, but gives you these beautiful, tremendously gorgeous flowers um, and you hardly have to do anything. So that's my idea of the perfect plant. I think on the edible side of things, my favorite would have to be okra. I just think okra, I feel like I'm the okra evangelist because I, I keep trying to convince everybody I know, especially at the community garden and in my garden club and, and everywhere else to grow okra because it's just so easy and so productive, especially in our hot, humid summers. And it's just a gorgeous plant because the open flowers and okra look like hibiscus. But I know so many people have been burned by having slimy okra dishes as a child that they're so gun shy about growing okra. But I'm like, it's not like that. Try it again as an adult. You know, based off of your magazine, as well as a lot of what you talk about in your podcast, it seems like you really love plants. And so I was wondering... Why did you study journalism and not something like horticulture or something else regarding um, plants? Yeah, it's a good question, Dorval. I would say it was because I was writing before I could even read. Um, I would take my parents' books off the shelves and, you know, the blank pages before and after on books, I was filling those in. <laughs> I wasn't actually writing. I was just scribbling and filling those in. So I've just always loved writing and reading. So that's the 
uh, tack that I took and thought I would always be doing for my career is telling stories and, and telling other people's stories and listening to their stories and passing them on. It probably never even occurred to me that horticulture was even a career that I could pursue. I remember I took botany as one of my science electives. I have very distinct memories of being taken by our TA down to the golf course at University of Maryland. And he gave us a tree ID class walking around the golf course. And I think that's the one and only time I ever set foot on the University of Maryland's golf course. Um, so I was definitely interested in plants at that time, but didn't even put two and two together that that could be a career. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey after college? Um, specifically, how did you come up with the idea of the Washington Gardener magazine? Hmm. Sure. So I was, you know, a feature writing major. So when I got out, I was working for lots of different associations in our area because Washington, D.C. is a hotbed of membership associations, whether it's a professional association like a nursing group or I worked for a school supply association, which is a trade association where the companies are the members of the association instead of individuals. And those were great. I loved my coworkers. I loved the work and the travel. But at a certain point, I started to look around and realize I was always going to be doing the same thing for other people's publications. And I wasn't really pursuing my own passion. And at the same time, I had uh, purchased a condo in Wheaton, Maryland. And I was gardening like a crazy person. I had taken over not just my balcony area, my patio, but I was uh, gardening into the common areas of the condominium grounds. And the condo association board said, "Uh uh-uh, Kathy, that's not your land to garden on. (laughs) So I was getting kind of a pushback there. And that's when I realized, okay, I need to find a small house or somewhere that I can expand my gardening. And at the same time, I was looking around with a couple of friends and I, and we were thinking what we could do outside of the association world for work. So we even had looked at party planning and some other types of things. And then I thought, you know, I've been desperately looking for information on local gardening for our area. And why don't I do that? Why don't I put together a publication that's about our local area gardening and my passion and put those two things together? That's really interesting. And so how did you come up with the idea for Garden, the Garden DC podcast, and how did you make it happen? Yeah, I'd been wanting to do a podcast for a few years, and I'd even taken um, a couple classes and talked to other garden podcasters and been listening to several other garden past podcasts for a few years. And I had even gotten together with my garden writing friend, Uh, Marion Wilburn, and we had sat down and drew up a list of topics that we would discuss on our podcast. And we had this concept, and it was a city mouse, country mouse concept. And she would be the country mouse out in um, Loudoun County, Virginia, and I'm the city mouse down here by D.C. And we were going to compare and contrast our two types of gardening styles. So it would would be a two-person talking podcast. And that's what our plans were up to the winter of, I think it was 2020 or 2019. And then COVID happened. (laughs) So we were both at the Philadelphia Flower Show and the Mance, the the Mid-Atlantic Nursery Trade Show that winter. And then the shutdown happened. And we were told, right, to lock down and stay inside for two weeks. And that was it at that point. So I said, I contacted Marianne and I said, I want to start the podcast. I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. And she said, you know what? I'm going to step back. It's all yours. You do your thing. So my first episode was interviewing her as the expert on what our experiences had been the week before at the Philadelphia Flower Show. So you can go back and listen to episode one and hear Marianne and I kind of stumble our way through <laughs> the episode. The sound is horrible. Um, I think you can hear the wind outside. We didn't know what we were doing. I barely knew how to edit it together. Um, so I just decided this is the shutdown. This is my my break in time, my opportunity to do it. And I just threw it up there 
and the episode was up. And then I thought, is this going to be weekly? Is it going to be monthly? Is it going to be bi-weekly? So as long as the COVID shutdown was happening, I said, I will put an episode out every Saturday for as long as the shutdown, right? And then the shutdown was another month and then another two months. And so that's how it grew to be weekly pretty much since then. I've taken a couple breaks for the winter holidays, but we're um, pretty much exactly one episode per week since then. Hmm. And so can you tell me a little bit about how the podcast has changed over time um, and improved? Uh, have you bought any new microphones or other equipment? Yeah, I haven't done new microphone and headphones, which I should. <laughs> I admittedly need to do more research on that. What I have done is switched over to recording on a website called Zencaster. Um, so that allows me to have separate tracks of each of our audios between me and the person I'm interviewing. So I can record them separately. The first, I would say maybe five or 10 episodes looking back, we were all recorded on a single track. Um, so if somebody coughed on one track, I couldn't silence that or edit it on the other track. So that was the big difference. And I discovered the Audacity uh, free um, editing website that anybody could use anywhere. So I downloaded Audacity and have been using that for the editing. I host the podcast on a app called Anchor. And Anchor is owned by Spotify, and that's a free app that you can load up your episodes and you can edit the different pieces together. So I have the interview piece, the introduction piece, the plant profile, and that sort of thing that I put them in whatever order I want to and can add in musical breaks in between if I want to. Um, and any advertising that we might have, I can, I can push those into the episodes as well. And the great thing about Anchor is you could go back, though I haven't. Um, you could go back and if, say, there was a segment I wanted to add into an older episode that wasn't there, I could amend it. So I could say, you know what, I should have put this um, daylily uh, plant profile back in this episode. So I could go back and add that in and people who listen to that episode now would have that added in. But I like to be um, kind of more on the journalism side of things where, you know, we keep it as it was so we don't go back and... Um, re-edit our blog posts or re-edit things from the past. It is what it is. We might add a comment or something at the end or an explanation if things change in the future. But, you know, historically, I want those things to remain as is. And so now that you've reached 100 episodes, I was wondering, have there been any memorable guests that you've invited um, to speak on the podcast? Yeah, I think there's been so many great guests that we've had on the podcast, and I'm so grateful to the many horticultural experts who have lent so much of their wisdom to this show. I definitely couldn't have succeeded without them. I look at those podcasts where it's just the host, right, talking and talking, and sure, I could do that, <laughs> but I would be bored out of my mind, and I'm sure some of our listeners would be too. And I love to, you know, really pick the minds of some of our best uh, gardening experts out there. And I try to pull from the local gardening world, so the greater mid-Atlantic area, which I define really as the east coast of the U.S., kind of from New York State down through the Carolinas. Um, I think I've had a couple people from outside that area. We had the episode uh, where we compared Washington State gardening to Washington, D.C. area gardening, and that's one of my favorites. That was a lot of fun to um, interview Sean and Allison of the Spoken Podcast and compare and contrast both our coasts. So I think in the future, I'd like to do an episode, maybe an international one, maybe comparing us with maybe British gardening or uh, gardeners in Australia, maybe with another country. So that might be some special episodes we do in the future. Um, other guests that I've really liked uh, or people who I could have really practical, useful information that the listeners could use right away in their garden. Um, Cause you know, there's a gar lot of garden theory out there, but I wanted to be super helpful that you could be out in the garden and, and they would tell you exactly what you needed to do. So like episodes on seed saving 
or pruning. And I think I'm looking back at our list of episodes and I was going to say one of my favorite was with Karen Rextrode on superior perennials. And that was episode 53. And Karen knows her perennial gardens. <laughs> she is just amazing. And I definitely want to have Karen on back to talk about that. In that episode, she talked about her favorite low maintenance perennials and their care. And I could listen to Karen you know, for hours and hours on that episode. And there's been so many other great guests that I don't want to just highlight and pick out any favorites, but I would say our most popular episodes have been the ones on the ornamental and perennial side of gardening um, versus the edible side. So that was interesting to me, uh, Dorval, because I thought that like our tomato episodes and episodes about growing your own vegetables would be super popular during the COVID shutdown um, in that period. But it's funny that episodes more on native plants and ornamental plants have been our most popular. I was also wondering which guests have made the most appearances on the podcast. I think that would have to be our first ever guest, Marianne Wilburn. And um, like I related to you that she was going to be my co-host at one point. Um, I think I've called on her three times so far <laughs> to join the podcast. We've had several guests who've done shows twice and we'll probably have them on another time. So Doug Oster is one that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, and we'll definitely have some repeats of some of those past guests. Um, Andrew Bunting is another one I can think of. And uh, Michael Judd, who spoke to us about pawpaws and then about willows recently, uh, was a returning guest. But I definitely think we'll have Marianne back on again, and she'll probably still have that record number, right? Because <laughs> we're not just um, fellow garden writers. Uh, but we're also friends, and I think we have a lot in common to talk about to listeners. Having reached 100 episodes, surely there have been times when, you know, mistakes were made during the recording process that ended up getting cut out of the final podcast. And so I was wondering, have there been any funny bloopers that listeners never got to hear? (laughs) <laughs> no, our podcast is perfect, Dorval, right? There's never been anything to edit out. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but I have not saved any bloopers, and that's because there's not been any funny bloopers. There's just been things like where somebody coughed or a door slammed, and those were never like anything that I would keep, you know, like the Star Trek blooper reels where there was something really funny to happen and relate. The only thing that ever happened that I should have kept, I think, was in the middle of one of the interviews I was having, uh, my cat Santino jumped onto my shoulder and slid onto my lap as he likes to do, except for I had the headphone cords across my lap and he yanked the headphone cords out of the computer. So in the middle of the episode, you can hear, you know, in a crashing sound as my headphones are ripped off my head. And then he's jumping around, tangled up in the headphones. So it would probably make a great video, but the audio just sounds like a bunch of crashing noises. And then me yelling at the cat to get out of here. And then me plugging the headphone back in um, and then apologizing to my guest for that craziness. Um, so that's the only big blooper incident I can think of from the past. Only thing, you know, other than that was, of course, you know, some sound issues where the sound went off on one end of the recording and somebody's talking and the other person isn't there, um, where there'll be some technical glitches. Um, but, you know, nothing a laugh out loud funny in that vein. Does Santino usually uh, try to get your attention while you're recording the podcast? You know, he's usually a very good boy. It's just every once in a while, he wants his tummy rubbed after he goes and eats food. (laughs) And that's when he traditionally will do that. So you won't hear him meowing too much in the background or demanding attention. He's a pretty quiet cat. But yeah, when he does the sneak attack and he wants the tummy rubbed, then all attention has to be on him. Right. And so so for our listeners... Could you briefly describe the recording and editing process for this podcast? Sure. So 
uh, we make an appointment with our interview subject um, and we do that via Zencaster, the actual recording with them. Some people use Zoom, some people use other software. Um, so we set up a live appointment and we like to record as if it is live, like one long take. Um, and we like to do minimal editing. So just if there's a, a long pause or somebody sneezes, you know, you want to go back and edit those out. But we try to keep it as close to live as if we're a live radio show as possible. Um, then that's the interview segment to the show. And I also record a plant profile every week that we use the same audio from that plant profile to create a video for our YouTube channel. So one of our other interns will edit together that audio with video footage of the plant um, and put that up on the YouTube channel, usually around a week or two before or after it's used in the episode. So I like to do plant profiles of plants that are in season and looking good while the episode is uh, also at the same season. So you're not, you're not going to hear me talking about tomatoes in December. Say so we like to keep it really seasonal and current. And then um, I added a segment called What's New. And so I, by that, I mean what's new in the garden. So I like to just talk about what's current and what's new. And that could be a kind of dated, right? So it's like my little journal of this is what's growing in the garden. This is what's at the garden plot. And this is what's happening locally in the garden world or some upcoming talks that I'm given. And those I figured could be edited out in the future. So because those are very timely and time specific. Um, so whereas the episode part of the interview part of the episodes, those could be listened to at any time. Those don't actually have to be um, listened to in season, unless of course you want to. Hmm. How prepared are you usually uh, before a interview? Do you usually have interview questions planned beforehand? Yeah. So I, what I usually do is I like to keep it very casual and informal. So I will jot down some ideas that I have. And when I ask the interview subject to join us, I will give them a very open outline. So I'll say something like, we're going to talk about this plant and then we're going to talk about how to prune it or how to care for it. And then we're going to talk about some of the new offerings that are being bred in that plant category maybe. So it's very open in general. Um, I think some of our guests would really like it to be scripted <laughs> for me to send them an exact list of the questions I'm going to ask, but I really want to listen to our expert and then have that guide the conversation. So if they mention something, I want to be able to circle back to that and not have to just stick to that list of questions, right? I want to have it be a lot looser and more conversational and engaging. Do you ever feel nervous when you're interviewing a guest on the podcast? I know personally, I feel very nervous whenever I'm interviewing a source. And so I was wondering, how do you feel, um, you know, each time you interview somebody? I think on the scale of nerve wracking and confident, I'm probably at eight as far as confident because most of the guests on this show have been personal friends or people that I've known from elsewhere in real life. So I would say 90% of them I have met and spoken to before. So it's not like going into a cold call. The only ones that I find, you know, where you're a little bit nervous is if you haven't really spoken to them before and don't know them very well, uh, because there's a principle in journalism that you're not ever supposed to ask a question that you don't know the answer to that your what your subject is going to say. You don't want them to surprise you, right? Um, so there are some times where I'm just fishing and I'll ask a question and I'm hoping what they're going to say is what they're going to say. But, you know, sometimes you put that fishing line out there and then they come back with something completely different than what you expected. And then you just have to roll with it. Um, but you know, as a journalist, I have to do a little bit of research too in advance 
whether I know my subject personally or not, I'll usually go and I'll look them up on LinkedIn. I'll usually look at their website and their bio and then maybe read some of their most recent articles if they've written articles or if they've given a talk that I could look up on YouTube. I might check that out in advance. So then I know some of the things I might want to ask them more about or have them expound on and explain a little bit for our listeners. And when it comes to editing the podcast, have interns always been involved with Garden DC? Yes, I think maybe not the first 10 or so, because that was during the total shutdown um, when I launched the podcast by myself and was editing it by myself. Um, but I think from the summertime onward, so I want to say maybe May of that year onwards, then the interns were either helping with editing or helping um, set up the interviews. So they were always helping with that and um that you might actually be able to hear it as a listener, some of the different editing. So, you know, some interns were are much more exacting, like they might take out every um in a conversation. I personally will leave those in and don't mind if there's some of those, you know, verbal tics that somebody might have in the way they speak. Hmm, that's really interesting. And so for any listeners who are interested in starting their own garden podcast, Kathy, is there any advice you'd like to give them when it comes to starting off? Sure. I would say first, yay, <laughs> for, go ahead and do it. I would say definitely pick your niche. So your specific area, the more specific and narrowly focused, the better. So I'm Garden DC. I'm specifically for our mid-Atlantic area. We do have international listenership, which I'm grateful for and love that people from other countries enjoy the show as well. But everybody who comes into it as a listener can read the description and then they know it's focused on plants we grow in our area and specifically how to grow them uh, in this region. It, a lot of it can be applied to other regions, um, but it is specifically addressed to us, just like Washington Gardener Magazine is. Um, so I would say whatever your passion is in gardening, you should make that your focus because there are so many general gardening podcasts out there and we kind of don't need, you know, another how to plant such and such. Um, but, you know, there could be one about propagating houseplants. Like there's tons of houseplant podcasts, but specifically about, you know, one aspect or one uh, niche part of it, or it could be more your personality or your personality driven. Um, so think about how you would come at it that. And not all pack podcasts need to be interview format with experts. Um, like I alluded to earlier, it could be just you sharing your stories. It could be a short form, like 15 or 20 minutes. It could be monthly could be um, every day. There are some friends of mine who do garden podcasts that are just like five minutes long, but every morning. And they're kind of like what to do that day in the garden type podcast. So very, very different format from what I'm doing here. Um, so my other advice would be to listen to as many other garden podcasts and podcasts in general before you get started. I spent a month listening to a different garden podcast every day when that was in the research pro process when Marianne and I were thinking of starting a show. Um, so each day I picked a different garden podcast from around the world and listened to several of their episodes so I could hear what I liked about their shows and what I didn't like. And so I knew exactly, you know, these were the type of things I wanted to include. These are the type of things that I definitely don't want to include. Um, so definitely do that for yourself. Do some research. And the other advice I would give that uh, somebody gave to me too late, <laughs> which I didn't do, was that you should record your first three episodes and then release them as a group and maybe even throw out that first episode. So if I you know, could go back in time because of the sound quality, because of such the roughness of that first episode, you know, I could have thrown that away and not released that out to the world. But again because I'm on the journalism side of thing more than the, you know, fictional or storyteller side of thing. I'm going to let that be out there because that's the truth that that was where we were at. That's where we started. And that's where we are today. Um, but releasing it first three episodes or so as a group 
is a nice way to introduce yourselves to your listeners and to um, get yourself settled in and get your rhythm. Because I think by your third, fourth, fifth episode of taping it, then you're kind of relaxed into it. Then you kind of know your rhythm and what the show is going to be about. You're kind of exploring and floundering before that point, um, which, you know, the listeners could hear, but they're going to grow along with you. So I went ahead and just, you know, I like to go by the principle of better done than perfect. So I feel like if I just didn't throw it out there quickly and get it out and send it out to the world, it never would have got done at that point. I would have just gotten super busy again and not even been able to do the show at a certain point. So it was like, it was either now or never get it out there. Um, And I'm definitely a perfectionist in everything, but I also know the point where you just have to say, right, uh, good enough. You know, it's good enough to be out there in the world and I'm happy with what it is at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, I find it really interesting that earlier you mentioned um, having international listeners, despite, you know, Garden DC being a very local show. And so I was wondering, are there any like very, you know, very interesting and very notable countries in which some of your international listeners come from? Yeah, I'm going to pull up our dashboard as I'm speaking to you, Dorval, and we're going to look at some of our stats together. Um, and I'm always surprised when I scroll through some of those stats and look at the countries. So, of course, the great majority of listeners are the U.S., Canada, um, U.K., because, of course, English-speaking countries make sense. Um, we do have a good percentage in Germany um, and Europe, Norway, Sweden, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, but we even have a small percentage in Russia. Uh, I was going to scroll down the list. Malaysia surprised me. Uh, Chile, Israel, and I'm scrolling all the way down. And we have a uh, little less than 1% in Luxembourg, which is such a tiny country. I'm like, yay, shout out to Luxembourg for joining us. Uh, Guatemala, which I was happy to see. Bulgaria, Ghana, uh, Nepal, Lithuania, and I'm still scrolling down, Turks and Caicos, um, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Lavinia, Hong Kong, Jordan, and then way, we got several, several more countries that I'm skipping over, but shout out to everybody out there. Way at the bottom is the Cayman Islands. So hello, Cayman Islands. I can share some of our other stats, which I find interesting, and they shift around a lot. So like one week I might look and we have a greater percentage of listeners, like 2% in Sweden for whatever reason that week, that episode was higher in Sweden or, you know, 1% in Trinidad and Tobago. So who knows what caught their attention and why. Um, But uh, some of our other stats, our current listenership is 55% female and 40% male, and the rest are either non-specified or non-binary. Usually it's much closer to like 50-50 male, female. And I'm guessing it's because that I have in the last few episodes been more female guest heavy. Um, So I feel like that has attracted more female listeners um, when I do that. And then the age breakdown, our biggest contingent uh, by far is 35 to 44. Um, And then the next highest is 45 to 59. And then the 28 to 34 group. Those are our three biggest listener groups. Um, The over 60 is about 11%. And I think that's because there's just not that many in that age group listening to podcasts. So I really wish we could get out there and be on the radar of more of our, our senior gardeners. Um, Cause I think they would really enjoy the podcast. They just don't even know podcasts exist. I bet a bunch of them don't even, you know, know that that's an option. Um, and then about 6%, uh, 8% are under 25, um, which is always nice to see too. And so for listeners who maybe have gotten through all 100 episodes, are there any other Garden podcasts that you would recommend for listeners of Garden DC? Sure. I've been interviewed on several other podcasts. And so it's really fun to have the other side of, you know, the the table turned on you and be the interviewee, just like we are today, Dorval. Um, So In the Garden with Leslie is a terrific one. And she was one of my guests a few episodes ago. So definitely check out that one. 
Um, there is a BBC uh, British Gardening podcast that I love a lot. Um, there's so many BBC British Gardening podcasts. You're, you're definitely going to find one um, that will gel with your personality and that you'll gravitate to. There's, there's just a long list of those that I could recommend. Um, and I also started a Facebook group that's open to anybody in the world to join, and it's just called Garden Podcasts. And that is a group for people who listen to garden podcasts and people who also produce garden podcasts to put up their episodes. So if you have a garden podcast and want to join that Facebook group, it's open to anybody and you can put up your show in a description and also say, here's my latest podcast when you put up a new um, episode. And also, if you're a listener of Garden Podcast, you can join that group to find new podcasts to discover. And also, you can post, yeah, I just listened to this great podcast from this Australian Garden Podcast show. You guys should check this out. Um, so I just wanted that Facebook group to be out there so people could share their own work, but also discover other people's great podcasts as well. And so how can listeners contact you, Kathy? Sure. I'm really active on social media so that's probably the best way is to just contact me at wdc gardener on twitter is i kind of live on twitter <laughs> so you'll find me there a lot um so you can just respond to one of my posts and or have a conversation there i put up the podcast episodes also on youtube every week um, so you can comment under those podcasts or you can comment at our blog at washingtongardener.blogspot.com and we can correspond that way um, you can of course get me through the magazine and those contact points um, but in general you'll find me at social media at wdc gardener is the best way to get a hold of me and is there anything else you'd like to say uh, about your magazine or anything you'd like to say to your listeners? Yeah, Dorval, thanks for asking. So we are, I'm looking at the statistics right now, we're just a hair under 50,000 plays or downloads. So that's going to be a big milestone for us. And the 100th episode that we're recording right now is another big milestone that I hadn't anticipated or even thought about or even, you know, given much thought to the future of the, the podcast. At, you know, when I started it, how many episodes I would do or how long it would run or how many people it would reach. So I'm super grateful to all of our listeners out there and all of the ones who have gone back and listened to some of the older episodes. I'm really thankful when we're at like a gardening event we were just at the american horticultural society's river farm and at their garden fair and people will come up to me and say i just listened to your episode i love this episode or they'll give me feedback on uh, the show so it's great to meet people in person who are listeners and we do have our listener supporters um, where you could be a sponsor of the show for 99 cents a month or 4.99 or 9.99 a month so i'm grateful of course to all of those people who help this show um, be created and continue on by being a listener supporter and lastly are there any plans that you have for the future of the podcast any specific guests that you want to invite Hmm. I think I'm supposed to say something like stay tuned. That's a secret or something. <laughs> but yes, I have several people. I have like a long list in a notebook of the people I want to be on the show because I go to tons of gardening talks and webinars and I have so many uh, garden writer friends, garden communicator friends that I'm like, okay, we need to work you into the Garden DC podcast at one point, but we just have to figure out if it's the right season, um, if they have a new book coming out that they want to talk about that topic, or maybe um, they're between travel and I can get a hold of them. So it's always about scheduling and timing and also what the season is doing here in the Mid-Atlantic. Because again, as I said before, we want to stay seasonal and topical. Um, so I have a few people that I'm kind of holding under my wing and that I'm you know, really excited about coming up in the show um, that I hope listeners will be excited about as well. And then I have some episodes that I want to revisit and maybe update at some point. I don't know what point that would be. I think we still have so many subjects to explore, but at some point, you know, maybe we can do an update of new research or something new that's come up on a past topic that we've covered. 
Well, Kathy, thank you so much for letting me onto the podcast and interviewing you for your 100th episode. Well, thanks for doing it, Dorval, and thanks also for all your help and our past interns who've helped out on the podcast as well. So if you go to the about or the show notes that are on our blog or website or even at Anchor and open up the show notes, you'll see the, the intern's names and who was the editor of those. Um, so you can always go back and look at those credits that we do. I'm really looking forward to editing this episode, Kathy. Thanks, Dorval. And thank you to our listeners. If you all have anybody in mind that you think would be a great guest for Garden DC, uh, definitely drop me an email at kathygents at gmail.com. Or if you see me in person at an upcoming event, feel free to approach me and let me know about a topic that you'd like to hear about or a guest you think would be great for this show. And thank you all again. Species tulips plant profile. Species tulips are the original plants from which our tall modern tulip flowers were bred. These wild tulips originated in Central Asia, where they thrive in the thin mountain soils. Just like today's hybrid tulips, they grow from bulbs and need to be planted in the fall and winter underground. They then emerge in the springtime, bloom, die back, and return again next year. The species tulips are usually shorter and have smaller blooms than the new modern ones. They also tend to bloom for a briefer time period. They can naturalize and spread by seed in our home gardens if given the right conditions. They prefer a sunny spot in well-draining soils. The bulbs will rot if planted in moist or wet ground. They do not need any fertilizer. The species tulips you can most commonly find in bulb catalogs include Tulipa bakeri, Tulipa clusiana, Tulipa humilis, Tulipa sylvestris, and Tulipa praestans. Species tulips, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, we had a bit of a warm spell, and that brought a bunch of things bursting into bloom. In my own home garden, I have flowering almond, Spanish bluebells, hellebores are still hanging on, the mid and late season daffodils, mid season tulips, grape hyacinths, lilacs, lacogum, epimedium, primrose still hanging on, Redbud tree in its full glory, weeping hygen cherry still going, the Confederate jasmine vine just opening up, along with annuals such as pansies, violas, stock, and alyssum. The Brunnera is putting on a nice show, as is the Phlox stolonifera. I have a couple trilliums in bloom, and the Euphorbia is looking beautiful in its spring green dressing. Over at the community garden plot, we just pulled out a baby radish the size of a marble, but perfection. We're looking forward to picking more of those radishes next week. Meanwhile, the strawberries are flowering prolifically and are spreading out into the pathway, so I'm having to dig them out and push them back into the plot where they belong. The arugula is already bolting and I think at this point I'm just going to let it go to flower to collect the seeds later and try them out in a recipe and of course save some of those seeds for planting this fall. I've been picking some asparagus and I've been guiding the little pea plants tendrils onto a nearby trellis and looking forward to enjoying some of those peas soon. If you'll all do me a favor, I'd love it if you could review the Garden DC podcast at Podchaser. And for each of the reviews posted there on Podchaser, I'm going to donate 25 cents to World Central Kitchen, and they will match those donations. And this is in an effort called hashtag reviews for good. 
and that's reviews the number four good. And you can find us over at podchaser.com under podcasts and just enter Garden DC and you'll click on the reviews button and post that there. In the local gardening world, we have some really interesting stuff coming up. So there's an online talk hosted by the Potomac Rose Society on Sunday, April 24th at 2 p.m. You can register for that at potomacrose.org under the events tab. And the topic is Rose Rosette Disease, an update on the latest research with Dr. Mark Windham. And Rose Rosette is a most destructive ornamental plant disease in the United States. And it's really important that we stem that tide and find out how to combat that in our area in particular. Another upcoming event is the Northern Alexandria Native Plant Sale, and that's taking place in person, of course, on Saturday, April 30th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the parking lot of the Church of St. Clement on Quaker Lane in Northern Virginia. So they'll have 10 vendors from Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and D.C., and they're asking you to wear a mask. To find out more about it, you can go to northernalexandrianativeplantsale.org. Another local event that you might want to check out is the Baltimore African Violet Club Spring Sale. So they're back after a break for COVID, and that's taking place on Saturday, May 7th from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Joppa Town Amish Market. You can find out details about that sale at BaltimoreAfricanVioletClub.com. Happy gardening! If you're a crafty gardener like myself, I want to introduce you to Let's Make Art. I do a lot of DIY projects in the garden, from painting my garden gloves, to creating kokodama, to pouring my own stepping stones. And there's a company that can make it easier for you. Let's Make Art is a revolutionary crafting company that aims to help everyone to channel their inner artist, whether they're three or 63. With the assortment of products and subscription offers, there's an endless opportunity fun and access to easy to understand tutorials and resources for everyone to learn a craft or take up a hobby. Anyone can have art supplies delivered right to their door in the form of monthly subscriptions, project kits, and supplies for a variety of activities. You can start learning basic lettering techniques to get your more familiar with your abilities with hand lettering for that garden journal you might be keeping. You can also shop all the best lettering supplies, boxes, and kits curated and approved by in-house artists. There's free weekly art journaling tutorials by art journaling artists and instructors. Everyone can join with their supplies at home. Grab the prepackaged kits or get all the videos first with an art journal box subscription. Learn from watercolor artists and instructors. Whether you're a total beginner or you've mastered the arts, let's make art takes the guesswork out of watercolor and creates easy and fun kits. The only thing you'll need is a brush. Let's make art simple together. Check out Let's Make Art today by going to our special link zen.ai forward slash garden DC. That's zen.ai forward slash garden DC. Happy crafting! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen and Terry Spite, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space, while also making Making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. The Urban Garden, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City, comes out this spring. You can pre-order it now at Amazon.com and Bookshop.org.
Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to WashingtonGardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.